Hey, y'all. I'm Bud Elliott, and this is Cover Free College Football Summer School. We've done our research on the teams, and now we're bringing on the top team experts from the 24-7 Sports Network to help us fill in the blanks. Please follow us on Twitter at Cover 3 Podcast. That's Cover 3 Podcast. And leave us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. All right. Class is in session. Hey, guys. Welcome back into the Cover 3 Podcast. This is our summer school edition where we talk about college football teams and try to fill in some of the blanks. And really pleased to be joined here by Mike Schaefer of Husker 24-7. Mike, thanks for coming on Cover 3, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excited to uh, to come on and talk about yet another year in which Nebraska football could be good or could be a dumpster fire. We really don't know here, and Saturday <laughs> didn't tell us a whole lot, so it should be interesting. Well, let, let's let's talk about were were they good last year? Because in my power ratings and a lot of the power ratings that out there, they were pretty decent. I mean, like a top twenty five team for much of the year, but. They had some of the most insane close game bad luck I've ever seen with the three and nine record. It's this is very much kind of eye test first metrics first first bounce of the ball, I guess. Yeah, it's tough because it, it felt like what most of the Big Ten West does is put together games in which the other team doesn't beat itself. And most of what Nebraska does is put together games where it plays well and then finds a way to beat itself. So it's uh it, it was a perfect storm last year. They they had a much better team than a three and nine record would indicate, but they still had a host of issues with just finishing off teams. They were bad in special teams. Their offense wasn't particularly good in the red zone at times. They couldn't run the ball when they needed to put games away. Uh, so they, they had all the hallmarks of a of an average team that the luck just kind of ran against them. Um, but they they also could show up in moments too. I mean, they gave Ohio State a really good game uh, for much of the day, and Lincoln when most of the the team kind of knew the season was over at that point. And so uh, it was a, it was a weird season. And this year looks to be even more fascinating because the spring game on Saturday kind of looked like a program that had restarted. It felt like a year one program with all the different coaching changes and a different quarterback with Adrian Martinez gone and Casey Thompson in. Uh, so it, it definitely has a different feel around Nebraska right now. It's just unclear if that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing uh, for, for the upcoming season. So let, let's let's start there on the offense. Uh, new offensive coordinator Mark Whipple comes in. Um, I did a great job last year, I think, at Pitt, at, at Kenny Pickett, and I really let really let him cook. He, he threw the ball all over the yard. As you mentioned, Adrian Martinez is off to Kansas State, so they bring in two quarterback transfers in Casey Thompson and Chubba Purdy, uh, you know, both of which were fairly highly recruited guys didn't really find success at prior programs due to a, you know, I guess, a number of issues. Thompson just Texas was kind of a loaded room, and uh, you know, Chubba just really could never stay healthy for more than five, six months of time in Tallahassee. Uh, are we thinking new look offense here? What 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 are we looking at? Yeah, it's it's gonna look a little bit different. I, I think one of the the kind of fascinating things is Scott Frost had to make a, a big change with this program. Uh, you know multiple years in and not seeing the kind of success with his offense that he wanted to see. They went out and they got a veteran offensive coordinator in, in Mark Whipple, who tends to throw the ball quite a bit. And this is a, a program that, you know, has really talked about how they want to exert their self uh, running the ball on team. So it's going to be interesting how Mark Whipple's nature uh, works in, in sort of the offense that Scott Frost perceives or wants Nebraska to be. So that's, that's going to be interesting to, to kind of see. I would imagine the strength of where this team is with, with its offensive line still very much a work in progress. They're going to lean pretty heavily on Casey Thompson's arm uh, far more than they did with Adrian Martinez's arm. So I, I think that's probably a good thing, too, because you also bring in Mickey Joseph at wide receivers coach. They had some interesting transfer portal additions with Trey Palmer, Isaiah Garcia Castaneda, Omar Manning and Oliver Martin are two highly recruited guys that are already on Nebraska's roster. So they may have some of their most talent on offense at wide receiver. So it might make sense for them to, to sort of be a, a more pass oriented offense as they attack teams this year. It, it sounds to me like you're more confident in, in, in the new receiver group than you are in the offensive line. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, part of it is that Nebraska's offensive line, they didn't have their 
possibly their two best offensive linemen didn't go through spring. Teddy Prohaska tore an ACL uh, last year. That was a, a true freshman that stepped in at left tackle, did a great job against Aiden Hutchinson, uh, got his first start the week before, and, and right before halftime against Michigan, he blew an ACL. And so they're hoping to have him back to, to be their left tackle at the beginning of the season. I think that's going to be a really tight time frame. If they can get him back before the Oklahoma game in September, that might be more realistic. Uh, and then Turner Corcoran, uh, another top 247, highly recruited offensive lineman, a top 50 player in, in the 2020 class, I believe. He uh, he sat out the spring, and he's possibly going to end up being their center, replacing Cam Jurgens, uh, the only offensive lineman likely to get drafted from last year's group. So they, they have a, a real state of flux up there, and they have a new offensive line coach. And, oh, by the way, Donovan Rayola has never been an offensive line coach anywhere. He just also happens to be the uncle of the number one recruit in 2024 and Dylan Rayola and Dominic Rayola was a uh, former Husker. Great. So there's, there's just a lot happening with the offensive line and there's not a whole lot of reason to be confident at this point in time, especially because they really, their best five haven't played together and they may not until September. So it's going to be kind of hard to, to figure out how that sort of works together with a run game. And so they're, they're really going to have to get a lot out of Casey Thompson and, and, through the air this year, I think. I, I will say, with, with with the exception of the Oklahoma game, I feel like their schedule through Halloween sets up nicely. Uh, yeah, obviously, I should probably read off the schedule for listeners at home uh, who, who don't have it pulled up. But Northwestern, North Dakota, Georgia Southern, OU, Indiana Rutgers at Purdue, Illinois. The, your better defenses that you're going to face, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, are the final three games of the year. So if they can get that continuity uh, by – you know, Halloween, they, they they could have a chance to finish strong. Yeah, I mean, it, it. that's why Nebraska, for a multitude of reasons, is going to be pretty fascinating early in the season because if they can get out of that game in Ireland, which is another oh, – I forgot it's in Ireland, yeah. Thing. Yeah, it's in Ireland. <laughs> They're playing in week zero again. Bill Moose really wanted to get that week zero credit, and it, it really blew up in their face against Illinois last year. <laughs> uh, and now they – they have to try to get a win in another continent when they struggle to win in North America as it is. So we'll, we'll see how that goes, but Northwestern is a good matchup. I think for Nebraska, especially because that's kind of a team that, uh, you know, Pat Fitzgerald coming off of another down year uh, there, they usually go every other. Um, so it'll be, a, I think a pretty good matchup to start. If they can get through that first game, they do have a little bit of a runway with North Dakota and Georgia Southern before you get Oklahoma. And this is maybe the best time in the last decade to play Oklahoma. So, you know, if Nebraska is able, yeah, if they're able to, to, to get their, uh, to get things kind of going on offense and that defense can just be average, they, they do have a chance for a fast start, which is something they have not done under Scott Frost. And I, I know that's a big emphasis, obviously, uh, to just try to get some momentum going early instead of always having to play catch up. So to the other side of the ball, I, I'm a huge Eric Tenander fan. I, I think he does a great job. If you look at, at the guys Nebraska gets drafted, you know, and, and they've had some roster attrition issues over Frost's time, which is not uncommon for these guys who were hired in the early signing period era, and they, you know, we see the washout rate of a lot of these first-time classes that they do sign. I, I thought he did a great job. Nebraska's explosive play prevention last year was just top-notch. I mean, they really did a great job not allowing any balls over the top, and you know, they're trying to win – in the red zone, but I look at this and I, I got some concerns for the personnel of this side. Like I'm mm. still pretty confident in him, but four or five DBs who played 450 snaps are gone. Like uh, Mike, the other problem here is if you had five DBs play 450 snaps, that means you stayed pretty damn healthy in the secondary too, you know, and now, now four of the five are gone. It, how big of a worry is this? It, it's a big concern because part of why Nebraska felt confident going into last year is that they were really old on defense. They had a lot of guys between JoJo Doman, Ben Stilley, Deontay Williams, Markel Dismuke all came back for super senior years. They were old and they knew that system really well. And they had gotten better from 2020 into 2021. And they were a, they were a confident group. And, you know, there was times last year, I mean, they they stopped Kenneth Walker in a way that nobody else was able to. They were able to slow down Ohio State's offense and JoJo Doman's last game and really gave C.J. Stroud issues. That defense, Eric Chenander, week in and week out, sometimes, you know, without playing with some of the best players that he has, is able to put together a pretty good strategy. He's got his work cut out for him this year. You're you're going defensive back. I think the bigger issue for Nebraska might be up front on the defensive line. That's where they, I was going next, yeah. They, so. 
That's they're really thin. They had seven okay. defensive linemen available for him this spring. Guys got over 400 rep or over 400 reps in terms of practice and uh, scrimmage this spring. Um, and there's whispers that some of those guys were just putting together a good spring tape and are jumping in the transfer portal. They lost Tony Tuioti to the to uh, to Oregon. Uh, to, he joined the new staff out there. They lost Jordan Riley to Tony Tuioti in Oregon. That was a guy that they were depending on just for depth. They're going to be really involved in the transfer portal to try to find another defensive lineman or two. They need bodies. And so that's that's where the initial concern is because you got to be able to stop the run in the Big Ten. And then in the secondary, I think Travis Fisher has done a pretty nice job um, over the last couple of years when he's had to adjust and he's found some different guys. They're really excited about uh, Deshaun Singleton, a junior college defensive back that they're going to have to play safety for him. Tommy Hill out of the, the Florida. Uh, yeah, he's an Orlando area. kid from Edgewater. That, that's where Huge. I live. Huge nice win up. for them. Yeah, and they they really thought they were going to get him in the 2021 class, but when everything got shut down visit-wise, he wasn't able to come out to Nebraska. He ends up at Arizona State. He immediately makes that Arizona strategy. State didn't exactly shut down visits, Mike. No, they uh, <laughs> they had a different strategy, it felt like, the yeah. most during the uh, the early days of the recruiting <laughs> shutdown. So, um, you know, props to them. We'll see how that holds out over the long term. But I, I think the secondary, they've got some talent there. Omar Brown. Uh, didn't have much of a spring, but he's an FCS guy coming from Northern Iowa, had seven interceptions, was an FCS All-American as a freshman, freshman of the year. He's someone that I think they're pretty excited about. And then Quentin Newsom uh, from Georgia is in his third or fourth year with the program. It's, it's hard to remember with the COVID year, I'm telling you. I don't know how you guys do it. You have to cover all these different programs and know which guy has fifth, six years of eligibility. I have one program. It's tough to remember. But Newsom had a great year. He started 12 games last year for Nebraska. He came on as one of their best corners. They feel really good about half the field. And so if they can get the rest of that secondary to come along. Um, but it linebacker, they're very experienced. And Eric Shenander has a lot of different ways he can go. They're going to mix 4-3 and 3-4 looks on teams. It's just whether they can figure it out in the trenches. If, if they're able to survive with their their limited numbers and they have guys they like but it's just you can't afford any injury they could be okay defensively and that runway we were talking about with the offense that kind of works defensively too they don't really face any offenses yeah. that have you super concerned so it gives them a little bit of time to get settled and and for guys to kind of figure out some roles in 2022 so i i uh i know we had a big debate on this on cover three northwestern actually uh, has been the worst power of offense the last two years that we're not a COVID year. So I I mean, that's a nice opponent to open with as far yeah. as if you have defense to break in. Georgia Southern really can't throw. North Dakota is a mixed bag. Oklahoma can throw it on you. Like that's a concern. Yep. But Indiana's a we'll see. Rutgers, I don't think can throw the ball still effectively enough to really scare you. Purdue can throw it. And Illinois, yep. probably not a great throw team. Minnesota's not bad. Again, through Halloween, you're facing two, maybe three offenses that really scare you throwing the ball. Um, Illinois can run it on you, obviously. But um, so let's let's end on this. And I, I think it's been a great conversation. I've, I've learned a lot. I mean, this is why we do these. We're trying to fill in the blanks and figure out what you know what my notes have wrong. One thing I'm pretty sure I got right though is that Nebraska special teams uh, they just made me want to throw things last year, man. I like I I had on our cover three locks pot. I had you know good Nebraska bets. I I had Michigan State dialed in the whole year, right? And I'm like, no, it's time to get off that Michigan State train. We're going to get Nebraska here. And then they punt the ball. It's harder to punt a ball further away just physically within, like, the physics of how big a football field is, further away from your coverage team. Yep. And that, that Michigan State – they were, Connolly, my friend Bill Connolly, had them 127th in special teams ratings. And I've been doing this a long time. I don't think I've ever seen a top 25 power-rated team be bottom three in the country in special – like, how – Please tell me it's going to be better just by random, like positive regression, maybe something. Yeah. I mean, just there's, there's <laughs> it's really hard. hard to imagine it being worse. Right. So um, from that alone, they, they've taken a, a multifaceted approach with special teams this year. They now have a special teams coordinator and Bill Bush, who's really involved uh, with special teams at a couple different stops, whether it was with Wisconsin or when he was most recently at LSU. And then he was involved in special teams when he coached at Nebraska before. So they have a designated special teams coordinator. We'll see if that matters as much. Bill Bush was helping behind the scenes as an analyst last year. Um, so it's not like there's a huge change in terms of schematics. What they did is they went out and they got a couple of FCS guys that were really good at their craft. Brian Buschini was the punter of the year for Montana, uh, the FCS punter of the year. So they're replacing um, 
a horrific punting duo. I mean, that's I. You try yeah. to be kind, but it was really bad last year. Uh, I'll tell you, there's nothing I've ever seen quite like sitting in the press box at that game against Michigan State, watching the ball go in the air and knowing that the coverage unit was not, and just knowing, like you, I knew as soon as a guy caught that ball, and it's hard to tell on television, I'm sure, but when you have that press box angle, you knew that was a disaster immediately. So they they have Brian Buscini, and that's going to help. Timmy Bleakroad did not come here this spring, but he is the Furman, or he was the kicker for Furman last year. He's 16 and 19 from field goal. Uh, Connor Culp was the Big Ten kicker of the year, and then he just lost it. And they did not have another place kicker that could really help them out at all. So we'll see kind of what happens there. I think part of the problem Nebraska had last year is they would find themselves in between not quite the red zone area and not quite the 35-yard line, and they would sort of be forced to go for it or sort of be forced to kick these field goals with no confidence that they could make it. And that kind of puts Scott Frost in a tough game theory situation as to what he wants to do. Uh, they trusted their defense a lot, and so they often went for it, and they just weren't that successful on fourth down. So we'll see. I, I think having more, even just baseline confidence at special teams – could elevate Nebraska to one or two more wins last year. I, I don't think that that's really too hard to pull out of last season. Yeah, I mean, if you just – if you give me average special teams, they make a bowl. Like, not only were their special teams bad, but they came at, at extremely high leverage situations. It, it's – you can't be you can't be 6 of 11 on field goals under <laughs> under 39 yards. Like, come on, guys. Some of these are layups. Uh, I – I would have to like really dig into the stats, but I I don't know that there's another media group in the country that watched watch more missed field goals last year because Nebraska's opponents were shockingly bad. Other than uh, Ohio State's kicker, who was perfect, I think he was five for five that day. Every other kicker Nebraska faced was really bad too. So there's just something in the water when when Nebraska plays a team apparently last year. How many uh, how many kick returns did they fumble last year? At least one against Illinois, right? Yes. Um, I think it was like, more of a punt return issue, if I recall okay. correctly. Because uh, their starting field position off kick returns yeah. is also like yep. bottom five in the country. So I'm trying to think. like It's hard to do that unless you have multiple fumbles. Well, and also when you're just really bad at taking the free 25 yards. <laughs> they love to return it to the 11-yard line last year. I think they averaged almost one a game. Um, it, it, look, mm-hmm. I, I joke about this, but there were times where you had to wonder if they were ever coached on the special teams unit with I mean, Cam Taylor Britt in the first game of the year, he's a really good player. He's going to get drafted on uh, here at the end of the month. He fielded a punt at the two-yard line, ran back into the end zone, realized he was in the end zone, threw the punt forward, and they took a safety in the week zero game against Illinois. That was a real thing that happened, and it wasn't even the worst special teams gaffe that they had all year, which is incredible in its own right. They had multiple punts that were less than 10 yards. I mean, the the things they were able to accomplish last year, I don't know that anybody's going to get close to. I, I I just feel like this is a nice bounce back team, but last year should have been so much better given that defense they ran out. I, I, nope. Oh, man. All right. Well, hey, I'm, I'm really looking forward to watching this. I'm looking forward to reading all y'all's coverage on Husker 24-7 and listening to y'all's podcast. This is going to be great. Uh, Mike, where can they follow you on Twitter? Yeah, you can uh, you can find me at Mike J. Schaefer, uh, or you can find us at Nebraska 24-7. We've got a weekly podcast that runs out, and then uh, usually a couple other quick hits as well as podcasts, and all of our coverage at Husker 24-7 as well. That is the place to be if you are a Nebraska fan, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. Appreciate you joining us on Cover 3 Summer School. All right, that's the bell. Cover 3 College Football Summer School is over for today, but don't worry. We'll be back soon with even more episodes filling you in on the top teams in college football. Please give us those five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow us on YouTube and on Twitter at Cover 3 Podcast, and we'll see you all soon.